Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you in the house on this beautiful second Sunday of Advent. I have a few announcements to bring to your attention. The winter coat drive is continuing. They need to be in by December 15th. Uh, extra blood drive is tomorrow between 2 and 7 p.m. Registration is there in the bulletin. We also have, uh, we need one Advent wreath, lighter, couple, group, whatever, uh, on the 19th. If you are a family or a group who would like to do that, please, please sign up so that we make sure that we have somebody to light the candles on the 19th. Christmas poinsettias orders are out in the commons area. We also have yard signs out in the commons area. If you live in a place where a lot of people will see, this is for our Christmas Eve service. We also have little cards that are have little angels on them with our directions on the back. Invite your neighbors and friends. It's an easy way. There's also bulletin inserts that you had last week that are here on the corner with an angel on it. And uh, just make sure you get that so that people can know what we're going to be doing. It includes our bell concert and the children's program and all the fun things that we're having uh, during the Christmas time. Uh, we also have angel tree. There was only eight left on the tree uh, when I checked right before the service. I don't know how many are there now. If you are somebody who wants to give a gift to a child uh, during this Christmas time, you need to grab those. They have to be back in by December 17th. Uh, and we are also giving food boxes with those. So if you want to bring in some food, uh, you can bring some food to put in that. Mostly uh, non-perishables is what we're asking for. Somebody has already donated turkeys, and so that's kind of what we need. If you are somebody who would like to give to Angel Tree, but you cannot go shopping, we will take monetary donations for that, and somebody will do the shopping for you. So just make sure you put that in an envelope and throw it in there and mark it Christmas tree, uh, angel tree for that particular uh, ministry. Also, if you are somebody who uh, likes to give online, you, uh, I, I don't know, I like the envelopes, it's just who I am, I'm old school, but some people like to actually give online. If you are and you get envelopes with us, we invite you to let us know that you do not want those envelopes anymore. If you want to do both, that's fine. Just don't say anything. But if you are somebody who gives online and you only want to give online, please let the office know and we will not order envelopes for you this year. Uh, I also have uh, two Bible studies that I want to get, tell you about. One is the men's Bible study. Where do you, we go from here? It's a Dr. David Jeremiah Bible study. And it's talking about the context of our world today. There's one sermon on socialism, one on communism, one on Marxism, and it talks about all the different things that are happening in our world today that we don't see and we don't understand. Uh, but he does a really good job of explaining those and showing where the scripture intersects with that. So if you're interested in showing that, the, uh, they will be meeting at the Parsonage on December 8th at 6.15. Also, uh, that's on the 8th. Or by Zoom, or by Zoom. And if you want to do Zoom, Dave, raise your hand. Dave Creasy, his phone number is 757-871-0773. 871-0773 if you're interested in that. Also, the Ladies Bible Study Group is going to be starting an Advent study January 5th. That's funny. I think that's funny right there. Anyway, they were in the middle of a study, but this is a really neat one. So if you want to start in the beginning of the year, uh, it's our hope is coming. And it's talking about the celebration of the promise of Jesus. So we invite you to come. Uh, they will be meeting on December 8th and 15th in the library. Um, they will not meet on the 22nd or the 29th. But if you want to be with a really nice group of women who study the word of God, they're a good group to be with. So we want to let you know about that. Now, I do not have any more announcements. Are there any more from the body of Christ? Being no more, I ask that you center yourself and focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Mm -hmm.
Would you please stand and let us share together the lighting of the Advent wreath. We will start by singing Emmanuel, Emmanuel. standing as we light the Advent wreath. Hi, good morning, church. Good morning. Our lists are long, even in this strange mess where we live these days. And we want to do it right, we want to be safe, but we want to be able to enjoy the season. We've got work to do to put right what has gone wrong to heal what is broken, to mend the relationships, and to prepare for the unexpected guest and company that will come. Then the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and told him, Do not be afraid. Trust in God. God will send you a harbinger to show his love. This messenger will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. He will be a blessing to you in your old age, and Elizabeth will experience God's love and no shame no more. So we light these candles as a sign of God's love and message of hope that the God we worship is not far from us and that we can clear the way for God to come and dwell with us. We light these candles in hope that God's love miracle will be coming soon. Say with me, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let us pray. Father God, we struggle to do what is right. And as the world brings in disillusionment, we often lose faith. Please bring forth the unexpected guest of Christmas, the harbinger of your love, so we may come to know your love and find our path of hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain standing as we share together our Christmas, no, our hymn, Blessed Be the God of Israel.
Sunday of Advent, we come in anticipation and expectation that you will show up, that you would shine your light into our lives, and that when we leave this service, we'll be closer to you than when we came. We pray this in Jesus' holy name, and everybody says amen. I invite you to remain standing as we share our affirmation of faith this morning. We believe in God, the creator and giver of life who brought all creation to birth, who mothers us and fathers us, protecting and nurturing and cherishing us. We believe in Jesus Christ, God born among us as a fragile baby, embodying both love and the need for love, and calling us to rest in God as trustingly as a tiny child. We believe in the Holy Spirit, breathed into us at our birth, always drawing us on to be born again, encouraging, exhorting, comforting, nourishing our growth, and inspiring our living. We believe in the reconciliation of the word world to God through Christ, who was haunted at, and humiliated at death. Christ entered our fearful darkness, so that we might enter his glorious light and share the life of his resurrection. And we believe that each new child is a glimpse of the face of God, a sign of the life to come, and a call to live in peace and celebration. This we believe. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Amen. invite the children to come on down. I'm a coming. <laughs> See you now. All right, today we're going to be talking about things on top of Christmas trees. What's on top of that Christmas tree? A star. Why would they put a star on top of the Christmas tree? Got any idea? Because a star was above the manger, and what did the star do in the Christmas story? It brought everyone to Jesus. Good answer. Good answer. All right. Sometimes they don't put stars up there. What's another thing they put on top of Christmas trees? An angel. Why would they put an angel on the Christmas tree? Because an angel came to the manger. Did the angel come to the manger or did the angel come to the shepherds? Ah, shepherds. And led them to the what? To where Jesus was. That's right, to baby Jesus. So, so both of those are kind of what they call signs of what is to come. The star for the wise man and for the manger, right, that led them to where they needed to be. The star was over it when the baby Jesus was born, and the angels came, and they talked to the shepherds out in the field. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, that there was other places in the Christmas story where there was an angel can you think of another place? 
you might need to help us. Mary. The angel came to Mary. You remember the angel? The angel's name was Gabriel, and it says, Behold, you are going to be with child. Right? Okay. And also, actually, there's four places that it comes. It comes to Joseph, and he says, what she has is of God, so you need to take care of her. And he comes to Zechariah. We're going to talk about him. And he also comes to, we already talked about the one who came to shepherds, right? We're not sure if it was Gabriel or not. But you know, Gabriel actually shows up in the Old Testament too. He comes to Daniel and he tells him, Daniel has this dream and the king has this dream and he tells him what the dream means. So he is a messenger of God, okay? So, so when he comes to Zechariah, something cool happens. He, he, he tells Zechariah that he's also going to have a son, and that son's name is going to be, do you have any idea? They're giving you the answers, aren't they? They are John. And he was John the Baptist, and he was what they call a harbinger. Harbinger. Can you say that word? Harbinger. So a harbinger is a messenger that goes before someone else. And they said he's going to be the harbinger of the Messiah. Do you know who the Messiah is? He's the Messiah. Any ideas? I'm giving you the answer again. Jesus. I did ask for your help, didn't I? Okay. So, so say harbinger of the Messiah. So what that means is he's going to go before Jesus and tell everybody that Jesus is coming. Now, have you ever seen that happen where somebody's going out in front of somebody saying, Hark, hark, somebody's coming, somebody's coming. When did you see that? You don't remember. How about a parade? You see the band going, and there's always this one that has this big banner, and you know which band's coming? That's a sign, right? In the old days, because they didn't have telephones to call everybody, right, they would have somebody that was the town crier, and he would go through, and he'd ring a bell, and he'd tell people what was coming or what was happening. Now we have electronics, and we have all this stuff, but they didn't used to have that. So John the Baptist was to go before Jesus and tell everybody that Jesus was coming. So that's, that's an important thing, isn't it, so that they'd be ready. What if, what if we didn't know what was going to happen? Wouldn't we need somebody to tell us what's coming up? Right? Yeah. So... So one of the things that we know from that is that not only was he a harbinger, the angel Gabriel was a harbinger, and guess what we're called to be? A harbinger. You got it. It didn't take too long to connect the dots, did it? That's good. I'm glad. So a harbinger is somebody who tells the good news or tells people about the good news. How can we tell the good news of God? How can you tell other people about Jesus? What do you think, Emily? What's one way you can tell somebody else about Jesus? Yes, you know. <laughs> if they're feeling lonely, you can tell them that God loves them and give them a hug like you did for me this morning. Yeah. What's another way? Can you think? Set out signs. They're excellent. And invite him to church. What's another way? Pray with them. Absolutely. If you've ever seen anybody that's not doing well and they say, oh, I'm going through this problem, instead of just letting them sit there, you say, well, let's pray about that. And you hold their hand or you just pray with them. All of those are ways to tell them about Jesus. Or maybe God did something in your life and then you can tell them about that. So at Christmas time is a special time when we can offer Jesus to people and we can invite people to church. So we become the harbinger of the good news. So what I'm going to do is we've got these cute little cards, and they look almost like tickets, don't they, for people to come to church. So what I want you to do is I want you to give one to somebody that doesn't go to church and invite them to church. And I'm going to tell everybody else that they need to do that because you need to be a what? What was that H word? Harbinger. Can you say harbinger? Yeah, of the good news. Think you can do that? If you want more, I've got more. 
got lots of them, okay? Everyone out there has to have at least three. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for bringing Gabriel to give us the message of the good news. Thank you for sending John to tell us about Jesus. And thank you for using us so others can come to know about Jesus. Use us this day. Use us this week. Open us to the possibilities of sharing the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Good job, God. Notice we had a new director up here. Julie has volunteered. Sharon's, Sharon's ready to <laughs> Julie is here, and I want you to be praying tomorrow because we have an interview with a man named John Thomas. And John Thomas will be interviewing for the job. Hopefully, God will bless us, and uh, we will be blessed with a director again. Uh, our scripture today comes from the gospel according to St. Luke. You can find that in your bulletin up on the screen. Uh, Luke 1, 5 through 25, I invite you to read along. It was in the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abja. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children. Because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when Zechariah was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood 
to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now, at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn their hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know this is so? For I'm an old man. And my wife is getting on in years. And the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. And when he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, Father, I do not even want to begin to imagine what it would be like to become pregnant at 65 much less when I'm 70 or 80 or 90. And yet it's in the midst of your miracles that you bring in an understanding of who you are and whose we are. It's in the midst of this story that I find myself where Zachariah is and where many of us are today in our world, not quite sure what's going on, uneasy, in chaos, disappointment, or maybe even discouraged. It's in these days that we find ourselves unsure, but wanting and longing for you to come. So come in the presence of us today as we share your message. I pray that you would use me, God, to bring us to a place where we will not be anxious, but open and ready to receive the unexpected gifts and guests of Christmas. It is in Jesus' holy name I pray, and all the people say amen. It's funny how Christmas brings that anxiousness into our heart, and yet it's in the midst of that that God delivered the Prince of Peace. <laughs> it's the presence, it's all the stuff, the commercialism, all the things that seem to add up and make our schedules so busy. When I was preparing for our sermon today, I was reminded of a, a dear friend of mine who was a minister, and, and he kept his schedule so tight that if you wanted to go see him, you had to book two weeks in advance. <laughs> and I would often tease him. He'd say, oh, it's just so I can be disciplined. And I, and I would say to him, no, you don't understand. If Jesus walked in the door today, you would not have an opening for him. So I say that sort of tongue-in-cheek, knowing that many of us have those kind of schedules during Christmas. 
many of us are in those places where we think that maybe, you know, if we do this, then everything will come to peace. But in reality, it's quite the opposite. It's taking the time to breathe. It's taking the time to sit. It's taking the time to not be too busy for the times when Jesus shows up. Now, I know that sometimes we miss Christ. We miss him when we don't pay attention, or we miss him because we get too busy. But there's also times we miss him because we've lost faith. We've lost the thing that makes us excited. I call that entheos, the spirit. We find ourselves so overwhelmed that we miss the unexpected guest of God. And I think that's what happens in this story with Zechariah. It was in the time of King Herod of Judah that Zechariah was a priest, and he belonged to the priestly division of Abja, and he and his wife, Elizabeth, were very righteous. They were doing the holy thing. They did all the things that were, they were told to do. They observed all the commandments. They did all the checking of the boxes. They went to the Christmas parade. They went to church. They went to all the concerts. They did all the things that they were supposed to do, and yet there was this problem, this underlying problem that gnawed at their soul. They were childless. Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both old. Can we raise our hand? Who here would like to be pregnant with your first child at the age that you are? <laughs> no way. I remember when my son was in high school, and Mike looked at me, and I had wanted a third child, and he said, do you think, and I said, not on your life. <laughs> I imagine they were both at that place. Righteous, obedient, doing the things that we're supposed to, but yet they were stigmatized because they were barren. There was sorrow and there was shame in the midst of that because not to have a child in that age was quite a disgrace. And at her age, Elizabeth was feeling as if she had no hope left and, and there was no way she was going to be the mother of the Messiah and much less even bear a child. And yet it's in this disappointment, it's in this place of what we would call barrenness that God delivers the miracle. It's in the place of despair that she will soon see that not only does she have the fortune of bearing a child, but this child has a special purpose and meaning. And it all began one day when Zechariah was serving in the church. He was serving because he was chosen by lot, which was the custom of the priesthood, and he was to go into the temple and be the priest who would burn the incense, the morning incense. Now, this is quite a miracle in itself because there was over 20,000 priests, there was 24 divisions, and for the lot to fall on just one of them would be a miracle in a lifetime. And here he is there and God in his omniscience, knowing what's going to happen, and many times we don't, but God does. The lot falls on Zechariah. Now, I imagine there was an enormous anticipation and angst. Uh, I, I remember a time when the bishop was coming to the church, and I was all anxious, and, and, and that was the Christmas that at the Advent wreath, one of the kids got upset, and they threw up on the stage. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen, especially when somebody important shows up. And it was into this this unexpected privilege that Zachariah steps in. It was probably the climax of his career. And the scene would have been as follows. Before dawn, the worshipers would begin to gather, and they would gather at the temple door for the morning sacrifice to begin. And the incense priest would walk towards the temple, and he would play an instrument called the magrapha. It was a giant gong that would tell everybody, it's time to assemble. And, and then the Levites would come and they would begin to worship songs and, and do different things. And then the other two priests, because there was three that would go in. One would be the what they called the coal bearer and the other one would be the incense bearer. And they would go into the wonderful place, the holy place, and they would, they would place the coals on one side and the incense on the other with Zechariah in the middle. And they would have that ready on the altar. 
and the priest would go up to the altar after they left, and he would light the incense. I imagine that day on that small table, as the coals were wisping, Zachariah was anxious and trying to figure out what this is all about. Why did God pick me? Why, why did God choose me to do this? And yet in the same thing, he's just sort of going through the motions because it's the thing to do as a priest. Behind the golden altar would be the Holy of Holies, the place where if you weren't allowed to go, God would smite you <laughs> and you would die. That close to the presence of God. Only the high priest could go, and that on the Day of Atonement. And there in the midst of that, he's facing that golden altar of incense with to the right the showbread and to the left the candles. Now when the people that were outside saw the other two priests exit, because only one priest could be there when they lit the incense, the people would know it was close. It was time. It was time for that holy moment to happen. And so they would lay down and lift up their hands and they would begin to pray because it's in that moment that God would show up. It's in that moment that God would hear the prayer of the priest. It was in that moment that something magical was going to happen. They would bow down, lifting their hands, some in silent prayer, some speaking out loud. And the priest would light the incense, and offer prayers for the people in the nation. It's during that moment, with the people praying outside, when the incense comes to the fire, when the offering is being offered to God, that God shows up. But I don't imagine it's at that moment that Zechariah realized it. Because I don't know about you, sometimes when I pray, I close my eyes. And I imagine him praying for the nation after he lit that incense and just lifting that up to God. And in the midst of that, just pouring out his heart for the nation and, and invoking and asking for the Messiah to come and, and asking for the presence of God to be there, something he longed for so much. And yet, he didn't think what happened. And when he opened his eyes, there is Gabriel. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, if he didn't have depends on, he might have needed them. <laughs> it's in the midst of that place that right to the right side of the altar, he sees that vision. I'm not sure what he expected. I, I'm not sure if he expected anything. And I think that's maybe the problem. I think maybe when we go through the ritual of church, when we go to the places of prayer, sometimes we don't expect God to show up. It's just something we do. I don't know. What do you do at Christmas that you just do? Because you've always done it. We got to have the peppermint stick ice cream. We need to decorate the tree. What do you just do? Because it's expected of you. And yet it's in that moment that he's not expecting God to show up. My question is why not? Why don't we expect God to show up when we worship him? Why don't we expect God to answer prayer? Why do we get so caught up in this hard and calloused way, going through the motions, and we miss the experience of God? In the midst of Christmas, many of us miss the experience of God. Well, Zechariah, when God breaks in, is scared to death. He's scared to death because Zachariah says, do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. That's when he goes, whoops, what did I pray for? <laughs> Think about that. What did I pray for? Oh, I know. I prayed for the nation and the Messiah to come. I doubt at that moment, at that age, 
that Zachariah was praying for a child for himself. Think about that a moment. (laughs) And yet it is into this place when he's well advanced in years that God shows up and offers him a child. (laughs) We say, thank you, God, for unanswered prayer. (laughs) And yet it is in this prayer, this answered prayer, that a long-desired answer is given. You know, I don't know about you, but there's been times I've prayed for people and I didn't think God was ever going to answer that prayer. Perhaps it was for salvation of a spouse or a child or a family member or the sale of a business or a marriage that was going bad or someone who had cancer or a baby that you hoped wouldn't die. I don't know. There's a lot of prayers that we, that we throw up to God and, and we're not quite sure why they're not answered the way we think they should be. And they're heartfelt prayers. And so we give up or we lose faith. We get discouraged or we lose heart. And maybe that's where Zechariah was. But to Zechariah's surprise, God had the last answer. <laughs> and he hears the answer that Elizabeth will have a son and they will name him John. And he will be a joy and delight. I think God had to add that in there because I don't know about you. I don't know if that would be a joy and delight to me. <laughs> A joy and delight, and many would rejoice because of his birth, and he will be great in the sight of the Lord. I would be dumbfounded, I have to be honest, if God came to me and said that. I would say, but that wasn't what I was praying for. (laughs) I really wasn't praying for that right now. I mean, I I was praying for the Messiah to come. I, I was praying for, you know, the salvation of Israel. I was praying for the understanding of your inbreaking, and yet, God, I wouldn't think that it would happen for me. Oh, wait a minute. Let's connect the dots. What Zechariah didn't know that God was going to answer both prayers at once the one that he prayed a long time ago, and the one that he prayed today. Because God's timing is perfect. And his plan was that that child would be the harbinger of his only son. So not only does she get the holy privilege, Elizabeth, of bearing that child, she also gets the holy privilege of being the one who bears the son, who is the harbinger of almighty God. (laughs) And it's into this place that he speaks. The unexpected gift of God. And this one would be one that would be so holy that he would be a Nazarite. He would not be a priest like Zechariah, but he would be a prophet for the harbinger of God, the proclaiming that Messiah is coming. Get it ready. Everybody get ready. And that's when we see Zechariah's true level of faith. Can you be sure of this? Come on, let's be real. You, you know we're old? I can't get up off the floor anymore. I've fallen and I can't get up. (laughs) Now, his question seems innocent, but there's definitely doubt in that. How can a priest or a minister or a holy man of God or a holy woman of God, a Christian, lose faith? I can tell you many ways. Isn't anything possible for God? Yeah. Yeah. But many times we forget. Or we get caught up in our busyness, in our stuff, in our disbelief, in our discounting of faith. And though Zechariah was going through the motions and he was devout, he needed confirmation. And I think sometimes we find ourselves there too. And we often rob ourselves of a miracle because of that attitude. I don't know about you, but I'm getting pretty disgusted with the way things are going in our world. And I'm trying to find the joy of Christmas in the midst of the negativity. I imagine that's where he was. He had that attitude, and, and, and he didn't think that maybe this was possible, and, 
and it's in that place that we find ourselves because you know what we do? We, we don't look to God. We look at our circumstances. We don't look to the miracle. We don't look to what God can do, what God will do, what God will bring. Instead, we're stuck in our, can we say, stuff? Yeah. And instead of looking to God, we find ourselves stuck in our journey. Where are you in your journey today? Are you looking at your circumstances? Are you looking at God? If God gave you an unexpected visit today, would you humbly submit and find joy? Or would you be like Zechariah? How can that be? (laughs) Zechariah couldn't find faith. He couldn't believe. And that's why I think God pulled out the big guns and Gabriel, Gabriel put on the big pants and says, Hey, <laughs> hey, baby, I'm Gabriel. <laughs> I stand in the presence of God. You may not think this is possible, but let me tell you what's going to happen. And this is what it is, and this is the good news, whether you think it's good or not. In short order, Gabriel tells Zachariah who he is and where he comes from. And it's in this place that we get to meet Gabriel. Now, I don't know if you know the Christmas story that we shared with the kids, but he comes again and again and again. And he's always someone there to be that messenger who talks about the anointed one, even when he speaks to Daniel. He talks about the Messiah that's coming. He's the one that is the head messenger of God. I don't know about you, but I sure would want him to show up. I'd be scared to death. Uh Uh-oh, what are you going to tell me? (laughs) But wouldn't that be an awesome gift? This Gabriel, this angelic message, to have the privilege of God's primary messenger coming to me. Now, I know there's still angels among us. I know the Spirit of God is present. I know that the angels fight in the heavenly realms for us. I know that they watch over us. I know that they still bring messages to us. I hear of stories. I heard one today that Tim was sharing about someone who was willing to fix a tire that had caught on fire. And it's in those places that angels show up. Beloved, do you know that there's angels among us? These wonderful, unexpected gifts and guests of God. And do you believe? Because of Zachariah's unbelief, he had to pay a price. Now note that God still delivered the gift of John. But he wasn't allowed to go tell anybody about it. (laughs) He couldn't be the proud papa with the buttons popping off because he didn't believe. Meanwhile, the people are outside. They're waiting. They're waiting, as Advent is often waiting And when he comes out, they realize that something has happened in that prayer time. He was there and usually long, and and, and they were custom of the priests coming out afterwards because they knew about all those different priests that got fried because they went in the Holy of Holies. So they were a little nervous when it took them a while. And when Zechariah came out and he's starting to talk and, and give that blessing that he's supposed to give, all of a sudden he opens his mouth and... Nothing comes out. Now, I know many of you would like that. That ain't going to happen today. But it's in that place that they realize that something special has happened to him. You see? It's in that place that he begins to sign, and I imagine he was like, and they realize that he had encountered God. Have you ever been brought to a place where you encounter God and you're speechless? You're in awe. Has God ever shown up in an unexpected place in your life? You know, that, that really is what Christmas is all about. The question is, will we miss it? Will we doubt it? Will we find ourselves in disbelief? The story ends with yet another miracle. The miracle of Zechariah in his old age going home 
and Elizabeth getting pregnant. <laughs> That's just funny right there. And yet, you know, if it hadn't been in that time and in that place, it might not have been seen as a miracle. This is not in the text, but I think of how many people abort children every day. And yet I see in this miracle, the miracle of a child, a child being born, a child being the harbinger and being selected by God. And I think, as the scripture often says, before one day came to being, it was formed in the mother's womb. God had the plan. Elizabeth knew this and, and knows how blessed she is, how much God has shown that favor. And yet it's in that moment that God shows up. So the question is, and the thing I want to challenge you with this Christmas, is not to fill your life so full and to take time for the unexpected gifts of Christmas. Set aside your cynicism. Set aside the places that are just rote memory. Take a breath. And breathe in, God. Don't let it pass you by. It's not just another Christmas. It's this Christmas. And God brings his gifts each and every Christmas special for each and every one. Allow the Lord to season you with his blessings and favor this season. I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, Amen. As we begin the season in this second Sunday of Advent, we come to the place where we get to share what we call communion. The liturgy is a little different. Your responses will be the same. Um, and I invite you to, if you are online, to get some crackers and juice for you to share with us. And if you are here, I hopefully everybody got your, I call them sippy cups, I know that's sacrilegious, but your little cup of communion elements. So I hope everybody got that. Anybody need one? If you need one, okay, good. I thought there might be a few. Good. All right, so we're going to begin, and we're going to begin through what we call the invitation and the confession and pardon. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love, we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still disappointed. Christ died for us while we were still disillusioned. Christ died for us while our faith was not strong. While we were caught up in our busyness, while we were yet sinners, that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God. And you spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. 
when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all your company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymns, saying together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Yes, holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send away empty. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. And he humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by the water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to God and he blessed it. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of all sin. Take and drink, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as holy and living sacrifices in union with Christ's offering for us as our lives proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his precious blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in that final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church. For all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore, and all the people say, Amen. Now let us pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. I now invite you to take your elements and pull back the top. You'll find a small wafer there. Beloved, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for offering your body that we might know wholeness in life. I invite you to take the cup. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for the blood that you poured out to bring us new life. Father, there are many in our world today who need your life in their lives. There are many who need your healing. Think of Margaret Lee. Think of Mary Jack. 
struggles that the Sibbers are going through. Bay Trantham, who's struggling with COVID. Father, there are many in our world that need your touch. I open now the floor for the body of Christ to lift up those who need you. Hear this, the prayers of your people. For these prayers on our hearts and our lips, we give you thanks. Father, we do pray for our community. We pray for those who don't know you. We plead that you would come and use us this season, that others might come to Christ. We pray for our frontline workers who are still working around the clock, especially with this new variant of COVID. And we ask, Lord, that you would Grant them your peace and grant them rest. Father, I pray for our nation. I pray for the disarrest that is here. And I pray that your peace would come this Christmas. And I thank you for your grace and your mercy. And most of all, I thank you for Jesus, who came and allowed us to know the intimacy and the grace of the gift of your presence. Be with us this Christmas. Break in all those crazy things we do. And as I often pray, if I need to be hit with a four by four, go for it, Papa. Because sometimes I just need to be still with you. Allow that stillness to bring forth your presence for each of us, that we might experience the fullness of Christ this Christmas. And it's in this prayer that we pray and all people say, Amen. Well, I feel like I need to pull my ear. Anybody feel more peaceful now? Yeah. That is the presence of God. And it is that presence that we want to take with us as we leave this place. Our closing song is one about the angels. It came upon a midnight clear, number 218. And I invite you to stand as you are able.
as you go forth today, go forth in the peace of Christ. Know he goes before you and surrounds you and upholds you. And open your eyes to the unexpected gifts of God. Go forth in his holy name. And all the people say,